Hello and welcome to Fire in the Belly. Today we'll have myself, Mighty Pete, and we're joined by the Stacey McAlpine. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you. Good morning, afternoon, evening. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. We're going transatlantic again today. So listen, Stacey, it's great to have you on the on the show today. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for getting up nice and early for us. So I appreciate that. Just to give our listeners a bit of background, so Stacey McAlpine, the founder and CEO of Journey Fuel and Life Transformation Specialist has been helping people actualize their desires for more than 20 years. She got started working at renowned firms uh, to include PwC and Ernest & Young as a strategic advisor and project and change management consultant to some of the largest organizations on the planet that paid millions of uh, for this level of consulting. She has enriched thousands of lives using leading edge change management techniques to enable her clients to overcome tremendous challenges and pot chain yeah, create positive change. It is the unique combination of her consulting experience with her deep knowledge of life transformation principles that empowered her to create and bring to you what has been missing from all the personal development programs out there. Industry-leading foundational practices, tools and techniques required to activate change, to go from knowing what to do to doing it and empowering individuals to unleash their true potential. She is now on a mission to share these life transformational tools and techniques with as many people as she possibly can to enable you and millions of others out there. It has to be, it has to be more to life than what they're living today, to have the clarity, certainty, and action you need to live the lives you all love waking up to. Wow, Stacey, listen, it's awesome. I'm looking forward to hearing more about this. So thank you very much for coming on today. So um, yeah, listen, I really appreciate it. So I'm going to start with a really easy one for you. What does fire in the belly mean to Stacey? Oh, fire in the belly, I relate to uh, fire in the soul. You know, it's one of those where um, sometimes when it, the flame goes out, life just gets to be a big drag and um it can be you know, i used to relate life to purgatory <laughs> i was at a place where i felt like what did i do wrong there's got to be something that i just am not clicking on there's something that i, I could learn or something because this can't be what life's supposed to be like and when you lose the fire in the belly it's just you know you wonder really I'm going to have to have 40 more years of this. <laughs> the lifespan being that long can become a drag, and that's a bad sign. So, um, you know, I think of it as just being able to feel like this life is about something um, that you want to live and that there are things here that, that you really want to make sure that you can experience and live life and really feel like that's a legit statement and it's not just something to say. Oh, you know, life is short. You got to like it while you're here. And that's just not really enough to keep us going when things aren't um, on fire. So mm -hmm. it's really about finding what is that fire? What is that flame? What is that spark that gets us actually wanting to wake up in the morning? And that's why I created Journey Fuel and used that terminology specifically because, you know, they, the, um, the going saying of life's a journey you know, enjoy the ride. Well, how do you enjoy the ride if you don't have any fuel in your in your heart and your soul? So it's easy sometimes to get started, but then to keep going is the hard part. So that's where the fuel part comes in. There's something to just keep us going. So that's my long way of explaining that it's really about having a passion for life. And it's not as simple as saying that you want to have passion. Like there's there's more to it than that. <laughs> How long have you been at that stage then in terms of actually living that passion for life, that sort of really developing or, or you know, being at that stage? Because quite often we find with entrepreneurs, there's typically there's a change point. There's a, there's a time when, you know, as you said, purgatory. Oh, yeah. to, I'm assuming you're not in purgatory anymore. I'm assuming that phase has passed completely. No, thank God. No, no, definitely not. No, so it was about a decade ago when... I just was at a place where, um, you know, I was working 50 to 60 hour weeks. I was raising a teenage stepdaughter. I had um, one child of my own with one on the way. So a four year old with another one on the way working at a big firm like PricewaterhouseCoopers at the time, which in consulting is um, 
a very stressful, high pressure, high expectation, often unreasonable expectation career where that typically needs to come first. And my husband was in law school at the time, full time. And so I was the only income. We were upside down on the mortgage. I was $98,000 in credit card debt, just trying to survive. And I had, you know, a 45 minute to an hour one way commute. And it was like, just, you know, no family to help me. They were all cross country and I was just burned out and, uh, but didn't feel like there was really a way out because he was in law school. We were racking up $200,000 in, in law school loans, plus the mortgage, plus the, you know, it starts to add up and the light at the tunnel just wasn't there. And I just thought, well, where the hell is that going to come from? Like, where is the light? Like, how do you turn something like that around on one income plus all that debt coming? And, you know, our head can start to spin. And um, that just wasn't who I was. I was really stressed out. I was snapping at my daughter for being a kid, you know, um, skipping down instead of walking down the hall. And I was at the mall of all places. And um, it was with a client friend. And so it was a client that I'd had for a while and we'd become close over time. And so we're at the mall, which dates us right there, right? <laughs> um, I'm pushing the stroller and snapping at my four-year-old and my client just looked at me and was like, you know, something needs to change. You, you, you can't keep going on like this. It just, you know, for your own sake, something needs to change. And it's not like I didn't know that. It's like, oh, Wow, I never heard of that before. I never thought of that. Wow, thanks for sharing. It was just like, yeah, I know. But, you know, what are you going to do? And um, so after that, we had lunch and I was getting in the minivan to go home and strap my daughter in her car seat and we're getting ready to, to drive down the road, get all strapped in, turn on this music that was, I don't know if you've ever heard of those Hallmark CDs from way back in the day. It was like this lovely drive in the country, I think it was called, and it's just happy, you know, pleasant music. And and I just started bawling. And it just hit a string of um I there was time when I used to listen to that with when I was dating my husband. And we would have this, you know, joyous time. We were connecting, we would be out and about, you know, enjoying one another. And I could not even tap into that. For a second, like it was just numb. I couldn't even remember the last time that I felt like that. And it just was like, wow, you know, I, and it was like what I was saying before. So if I, I think it was, that, it was how old was I back then? I keep forgetting my age. This is around 35, 36. And I'm like, there, this is what I've got 40 more years of this. Really? And uh, that just, I, how is that possible? Like, how do you get out of a place like this? I'm a positive person, you know? Um, and so anyway, so I'm driving, this is like the snot kind of crying, you know, like where you're just uncontrollably crying, glad that no one's looking at you. And, um, and it was just like, just this reality check of this is just gonna suck. <laughs> and no way out. So then fast forward a couple weeks later, and I'm watching this movie called Flicka. I don't know if you've ever heard of that movie. It's like about a horse. It's about this girl who lives on a farm with her family and um, she's kind of a problem child and she ends up finding this horse that's kind of a broken spirit and they bond. And uh, yeah, it's this whole thing about how she falls in love with this horse. And so it was still, you know, she lives in a normal family out and about and um you know they have their own business running this farm and it's like nobody has a blackberry like, nobody they have normal life challenges but they're like riding horses and you know i get it was a movie and they had their own versions of stress but it wasn't you know they weren't carrying a blackberry everywhere they went they weren't you know on their computer until you know seven o'clock at night and reopening it again after you get the kid from crying and go put him back to bed and then you still have more work to do from 10 to midnight and then you're back up at four to take them to daycare and they didn't have that. And I was just like, wow, other people have other experiences of life. And this is on, this is on me. You know, I chose my life. 
I chose to marry someone and support them to go to law school. I encourage that. I chose to get into consulting to support the family. I chose to have a stepdaughter. I chose to have, you know, my two kids and have this commute. And, you know, life circumstance can sometimes feel put upon us. But in reality, it's a string of choices that we've made. It's not like life just dealt me this crappy hand. You know, it's I have a lot more control than I think I do. You know, I don't have to live here. I don't have to live in the D.C. area. I don't have to live in these places. There, people survive on a third of my income. So, what's the deal? You know, there's got to be something here where I'm just I'm making choices that um, are just out of alignment with how I want to live. And other people live other ways that don't have these same stresses. So, I just was like, I got to get there. Just something clicked, and it seems so obvious but to people who may not be in that space but when you're in that level of overwhelm the idea of anything different it can be paralyzing you know your brain isn't working as well as it could be when you're at that level of stress um you're just not clear i think of it like a snow globe i relate that to when i teach my classes it's like a program so i call them classes because it's not boring like a class <laughs> but it's you know you think about um, it's like a snow globe. You know, when you shake the snow globe, it's just all the snow everywhere. And it looks, you know, it's, it's so chaotic. You can't see through it. But as soon as it like kind of settles, all the snow goes to the bottom, it's just a different experience of life. And to get the snow to settle, to stop and slow down, sometimes when life is moving that quickly, it's hard to imagine how to even slow down long enough to keep that going. So instead of like this constant shaking, the snow globe in your brain, and I just wanted it to stop. Like I didn't want anyone else to ask me for a sippy cup. I didn't want to do any more laundry. I didn't want the phone call, you know, to open the laptop. I didn't, I just wanted five minutes of quiet, of peace. <laughs> and it just what didn't exist. And so I was like, well, I got to get real. I got to figure this out. And I had done all this personal development and all these programs, and I just wasn't living it. And I was like, well, I'm just gonna go back to the drawing board and go back to values work, you know, look at what, how did I get recentered on what really matters and start to get that more a part of my life. And so I got really clear on my values and what mattered and decided that, you know, it matters more to me to wake up and have my kid know who I really am versus this big stress ball of a person and I'll figure it out. So I started looking for another job, even though it was a bit of a pay cut. I figured, you know, I'll find ways to cut down some other things that weren't as important. And so I ended up finding a job in a government job that was 40 hour weeks, no laptop, no rolling computer bag, none of that, no calls at seven, no proposals to do, you know. And um, so I got that job and it required a clearance, top secret clearance, which requires interviews of people, you know, so they were going to the last step of the process was to um, interview my boss. So I had to let them know because they were going to get a phone call. So I was like, you know, I'm I'm leaving. I'm, I found something else and I'm, here's my two weeks notice. And my boss at the time was like, why didn't you talk to us first? You know, what if you could work? two days a week from home, 40 hour weeks. And this was before COVID. <laughs> Working two days a week from home was not common, much less in consulting um, in that industry. And there are industries that just, that's just not done, you know, even if you could do it, you know? And I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna get fired if I do that, so no. So I went to the big boss, gave my two weeks notice and he said, Oh, why didn't you tell us, you know, what if you could week to work two days a week from home? And I was like, you know me better than that. I'm not going to just float through and kind of half ass it. That's just not who I am. I can't just kind of work. It's not how it works. And it was six months away from a promotion to director, which in consulting, it's pretty flat. So it goes from staff to senior to manager to director to partner. That's it. So once you hit manager, um, you know, director's the next level up and it's pretty much an up or out type of career path. So if you aren't gonna get promoted, you're not there for much longer. You're not intended to be a manager for life. So six months out from, you know, one step away from partner and I was willing to give all that up and 
And he's like, I said, name one manager who has ever made it to director, one, who has ever made it to director working two days a week from home, 40 hour weeks. And he kind of looks off to the distance and he's like, I think you can do it. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. So you've been in this industry for 20 years and have not one example of anyone who's ever been successful here and you think I can do it. Why do you think I could do it? And he said, because you do too much. And at that time, for whatever reason, you know when you hear something um, at the right time or it finally clicks and people can tell you the same thing a hundred times and just him saying that, to have it come from a partner who in an industry that expects so much from you to say, oh, you do too much was like, huh, okay. So I thought, well, so I went back to, um, it was Homeland Security. I went back and I said, could you hold my job for six months? And just to say, why not, right? Like a lot of times we don't ask for things that are actually possible. And I figured, well, what do I have to lose? If they say no, then I go work for them and I give this up. And if they say yes, then I'll give it a whirl and see what happens. And if it doesn't work out, I have a job. So it was this automatic you know, backup plan and sometimes we can make backup plans and we don't think we can. <laughs> you know, there are actually a lot more options when we get creative. So like, okay, fine. So I thought, okay, fine. I'll give this whole thing that you think I can do a whirl. So I started looking at, well, how on earth am I going to work 40 hour weeks? How do I go from 50 to 60 hour weeks to 40 and work two days a week from home and pull this off? And it just required like serious reflection of what am I doing that doesn't matter? And what do I need to keep doing or do more of instead? And it just, it requires you to get really clear on expectations. So, okay, if he thought I was doing too much, what is it that's specifically required of me to make director? What is required that I would need to be able to demonstrate to make it? And everything else is optional at that point. Same thing in my life I was like, well, what is it that it's going to take me to live a life I love? And what decisions do I need to make? What things do I need to let go of? What things do I need to do more of? And get super clear on that. And my background is in project management, process improvement, change management. I thought, well, if I could do this for my clients, why am I not doing it for myself? So I thought, okay, well, what if I combine what I do for my clients with this value stuff? with personal development, best practices and all of that and start putting the two things together to create a structure and a way of thinking that can help me filter that out. Cause that's what I did. That was my job. That was my skill set of how to get people to achieve things that they don't know how to do and to be successful. And when you get paid millions of dollars to do that in a contract, they don't, they expect a delivery of results. It's not like, well, we might be able to pull this off. <laughs> So there are techniques that are, you know, specifically designed to get results over and over and over. You just need to ask the right questions and get the right clarity. So I started applying that to my life and it worked. Like I literally started working 40 hour weeks, two days a week from home. And I made director at a big four consulting firm. And I was like, wow. And I liked my life, you know, it, and it was all about getting clarity on what really matters and reminding myself and realizing and recognizing that I have a lot more power than I think. And it's when you start drawing boundaries when change happens, because, you know, in consulting, we call it scope management. You know, there's something that, you know, isn't expected to, it is expected to deliver. And then everything else is what we like to call a lot of language, you know, gold plating or over delivering. And um, if you, over deliver sometimes you actually put too much on yourself and you don't do it or you end up doing more than you're actually getting paid for yeah you know, so it's a big deal to manage scope in a project like that so i'm like okay i'm gonna manage the scope of my life i'm gonna start thinking about all the stuff like what's in scope what's out of scope and knowing that i have the the measures or the the targets of what is required to be happy clear and then you could start to make choices. So from there, it was just a matter of applying what I had created and it worked and um, it was just a different experience of life. So it was to answer your question in probably the longest possible way. It's 
it was a decade ago of a decade of hell. And um, when it just got real of how I have a lot more control than I think. I have skills that I haven't tried to apply. And now I've found a solution that I can actually share with other people. Because that's what I loved about consulting is, you know, it's all about business process improvement means looking at a process and taking all the stuff out that doesn't work and making it, you know, streamlining it or getting it to function in a way that can be repeated over and over and over consistently and effectively. So that's like what we would think of as routines or how we're making choices. Is there a way to um, systematize, if you will, our choices? You know, what's the, the litmus test or the criteria for deciding what to do? And we all have that choice with every single decision that we make. So I just started refining that and creating, okay, how do I share this with other people? Because I'm not the only person with this experience. Um, and especially, you know, when in career paths where you go from the doer to the manager, that transition can be really hard because you're used to doing it all. And now you're now managing more people and it's a matter of, well, how do I let go of the stuff that other people are supposed to be doing now? or that isn't part of my role anymore. And you can apply that to anything. You could apply that to now that I'm a mom, you know, I'm, what do I stop doing? Or now that I'm in a family or, you know, I have a significant other, what I was doing in my life before, what what is no longer required, or I have a partner in life now, or I have other people in my life now, how do I let go of something that doesn't matter as much so that I can enjoy what does matter more? So it was all this whole process. It wasn't an overnight um, realization, I don't think. It's just this compilation of things over and over until you hit that breaking point. Sometimes some of us have to hit that point where like, we're one thing away from a collapse and so that gets us in action. So my goal and what I ended up doing, so I, I ended up switching jobs at some point into Ernst & Young um, because the, for a lot of different reasons. And then ultimately about a year and a half ago, now I guess it's maybe two years ago, I was able to go out on my own and start my own thing and really focus on how can I take what I created to, to help individuals, not just companies, to help individuals apply those concepts that aren't being taught out in the personal development space that I created from my consulting experience with the personal development knowledge that gets you from knowing what to do to doing it and be in action. So Journey Fuel is all about how to help people live lives they love waking up to, to get out of the waking up with that, <laughs> here we go again, feeling to actually wanting to experience the day. And that doesn't mean like jump out of bed, because that's kind of unrealistic sometimes, right? We're not gonna like jump out of bed every day. What's gonna get you excited to jump out of bed? It's what's gonna make you look forward to your day or want to get on with the new day and it not be just this repeated hell. So it was a journey and um, it took some, some realizations and um, some tools, frankly, you know, building the techniques and the tools that can help apply what we know and how to embed that in our choices every day. And how do we think about, you know, am I gonna live on a farm or am I gonna live in, you know, a, a 50 mile commute, <laughs> you know, to the city, it just whatever it is for each person, it comes back to fire in the belly, right? It's what's going to give you that fire in the belly, because without it, it's just a drag. And we have a lot more choice than we think. But we're in the snow globe, you know, to see it when we're in that state is almost impossible. Um, emotion takes over and we can't think clearly. So so basically, it's about learning how to get from snow globe state to clarity on my, from tools that we can apply to ourselves. And we don't have to wait for the breaking point to be able to make a choice to get out. Um, and how do we create that for ourselves? And you know, Tony Robbins says, you, you don't change for pleasure, you change to avoid play. Uh, you don't change for pleasure, you change to avoid pain. And so until staying the same is more painful than changing or than not changing, right? So, so 
I said that backwards. If staying the same is less painful than what you're associating with what you think change is going to take, you're not going to change. But it's when you start associating more pain with not changing that your behavior is going to start to move, which is why so many of us, it takes a disaster or something awful to happen in life to get us moving um, or to create that fire to get out of it. And um, so it's about, well, how do you get your own passion to create that and your own set of boundaries or understanding of what it is that you actually want so you know where to go and it's not just this crazy town life of misery. <laughs> so, that's my long answer, probably the shortest version of a long answer to get to that state. I'm, I'm really interested in something you said, you know, you're saying it's all about choices. Do you think, is it choices or is it just acceptance of what we have, right? Because things happen in life and you're saying, well, I wouldn't have chosen it, but that's what's being presented to me, right? Sure. Yes. Well, we have a choice of how to handle it. Mm -hmm. So we have control over most things, whether, well, we don't have a control. We don't have control over every aspect of it, but there's always at least one thing that we have control over, whether it's a state of mind or it's, you know, the level of clarity that we can be reflective. Let me turn the, sorry about that. Let me, I thought it turned off the beeper. See, there goes that beeping thing. Um, but it's, so for example, you know, I couldn't get out of debt overnight. I can't get out of, you know, we don't make choices to just get out of a marriage in a second. Like it takes some reflection or, you know, who we're choosing to be with, who we're choosing to spend time with. But when we have a level of awareness, which is a big element of change management and consulting, it all starts with awareness. And when we can start to develop a skill of awareness, of understanding where we are mentally in any state, we can catch ourselves before we get too far down the path of, you know, okay, so here's how I feel now. How do I want to feel instead? Okay, I want to feel that way. What choices do I have right now? that could get me closer to how I want to feel instead. So it doesn't mean you have a choice of getting out of your circumstance in that moment, but you have a choice of what direction, what's the next step that I can take, even if it's not the step that solves everything. It's something that gets us that much closer. And what I've found and what I do in my programs is when we're in a state of overwhelm or in a place that we just, you know, there, it doesn't allow for thinking clearly. Um, saying what do you want can be overwhelming in and of itself. So a lot of these programs will say, oh, let's come up with a life vision and what are your goals and, and what do you want to have in your life? And even if it's dreaming like, oh, I want to have these cars or this house or the, you know, it's still hard to go there. And what's my purpose? I don't know my purpose. And so instead of starting there, I start with, okay, well, how do you feel right now? And how do I want to feel instead? Because we know how we feel if we stop and think. Then we could say, okay, I don't, instead of I don't want to feel like this anymore, it's how do I want to feel instead? And then you could say, okay, I want to feel that way. What are options right now? Because you always have more than one. You always have more than two because otherwise it's black and white. At least three things that I have available to me right now to get me closer to the feeling. And then once you know the feeling, then you can start to say, okay, so if I'm going to feel that way, what would I have in my life? What would that look like? Who would be in my life? Who wouldn't be in my life? What things would I want to have? Because ultimately, life is a collection of feelings. All it is, the experience of life is the experience of feeling not about the stuff it's about the feelings the stuff gives us it's not about the people it's about the feelings the people give us so in reality it really all comes down to being able to tap into a resource we all already have no matter where we are no matter what's happening we have our own internal soul check or you know belly check you know what is this doing um in my life what what do I want to feel instead? And how can I get that much closer? And then the closer you get, 
the more clarity you start to get, the more you could start to get out of that um, state of mind of overwhelm and to where you can see a little bit further. You know, it's like um, when I was thinking through how can I help other people? And I thought, okay, well, where was I 10 years ago? Not where am I now? It doesn't help people to say, oh, well, you know, here's how I did it. And you can have it too. And that's not working when you're in a state of not even being able to think past five minutes from now or even in the moment, you're just surviving, you know. And, and um, I heard this saying once, kind of goes back to hearing the right thing at the right time, even though you've heard the same thing over and over, but it takes that if you're in a certain state and you hear it, it can pull this heart string, you know, like you feel it in a different way. And I was, I'm a big quote person and I read this quote and it said, life is to be enjoyed, not endured. And for whatever reason, like that just hit me hard, you know, endured really described how I felt. I was enduring life. It wasn't, en enjoyment wasn't even a part of the picture. Like I was just enduring. How do you get out of enduring to even just living in a way that doesn't feel like it's just about getting through the day. And so sometimes just hearing the right thing of what we don't want to feel, if we don't, if we focus on how, I just don't want to feel that way, that doesn't give us direction. To have direction, we need to think about, well, where do we want to go instead? And when we can't get to what do I want, because, you know, what's my purpose? I don't even know what my purpose is. How am I going to know which way to go? Well, you could say, well, how do I want to feel? And let that help you design your path. And it's really powerful when you, when I switched to that, it was life altering. That was another one of my moments. You know, I've, that wasn't 10 years ago, wasn't the last time I read a personal development book or got my own coaching or, you know, plenty of therapy. But I took one program that was, you know, I got more out of than seven years of therapy. It was a, a program with this woman that it was actually about learning how to date because I had gotten out of my miserable marriage. Um, and that was after doing all the values work, after getting, you know, I have choices, you know, how do I want to feel instead? How do I not want life to feel? And enough had been happening there where it's more than that, but lots of choices that to make. So I get out of that. And, um, but I didn't want to pick the same kind of person. And sometimes we have these patterns of picking the same people that just aren't our people. <laughs> You know, the narcissism that keeps, keeps to come back, you know, somehow we keep getting those people. And it's interesting, my attorney at the time actually said, you know, I'm a little worried because you are a narcissist of like an eight out of 10. And a lot of times people who meet six, you know, level six narcissists, they think it's amazing. It's like, wow, this guy like actually, you know, opened my door <laughs> or, oh my gosh, he like, bought me flowers you know it's like the little things that are normal seem like wow you know he offered to take the kids to school <laughs> yeah that's kind of normal like that's how it works in normal reality that's he's not like this amazing person it's just a normal person kind of you know but is there more than that so so it's like you know i worry that you're gonna just get the a less worse person for you and so I was like, well, I need to get trained or something on how to find the right person because clearly I don't have my own way of, you know, that. so Chris Howard says you can't read the label from inside the jar. So if I'm on inside, how am I going to know what I'm doing wrong if I've never had that model or whatnot. So anyway, I take this program. And it's such a powerful program and it was they did less answering your questions and more asking you the right question. We call them high quality questions, but not the annoying kind where it's like, well, what would you think? Yeah, what do you think? It was different. It was like, we did this exercise called a rut exercise. I teach this in my program where if there's some pattern that just keeps happening, you know, it goes back to, okay, where are the decision points in that pattern? Back to, you know, we have choices, right? So if the same thing keeps happening, if you keep picking the same person, if you keep, you know, allowing the same feeling to come on over and over and over, we keep getting the same feeling. So what's causing those things? 
kind of going through that circle and okay, well, if this happens, then what I end up doing is this. And then when that happens, what I always end up doing is this. And then when that happens, then I end up doing this. And we know exactly what we always do. It's not like we don't know what's not working. We just don't know what to do instead. <laughs> and so I was going through all these little decisions three things you could do instead, which is where I learned this three thing thing. And um, it was, okay, so, well, I would like, okay, so I'm doing this exercise. Okay, well, I could do these three things, but I wasn't confident in my choices. So I went to the coach and I was like, okay, I came up with these things, but I don't know if they're the right things, which, you know, they would always be like, okay, well, and then they don't know the right things either, right? It's not about the right things. It's what we think are the right things, which so blah, 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 let's coaching later. So it was like, well, how do you feel in that moment? And how do you, you know, it's like, okay, well, I just don't want that to happen anymore. You know, I feel overwhelmed or I get mad or I feel hurt. Well, well, how do you want to feel instead? I'm like, well, I just don't want to feel that way. She's like, no, how do you want to feel instead? Like, what do you actually want to feel? And for me, it was just like a mind, like my mind was blown. What do you mean, how do I want to feel? I've never been taught, if I ever thought about what I wanted to feel, it was always, you know, I would get in trouble or get yelled at because it didn't matter what I felt. You know, oh, no, you're fine. You know, as growing up, I love my mom, but she's a very positive person and I'd be stressed out about something and she'd be like, oh, you're going to be fine. Well, how do you know that? <laughs> What gives you this foresight into my future that I'm going to be fine? Like, I don't feel like I'm going to be fine. And that's not, I'm just going to be fine. Everything's going to work out. Like, that doesn't work. So I just was never really allowed to have what do I want to feel or how am I feeling and how can I, you know, what's the, what makes perfect sense about that, that it's okay to feel that way to get to, well, how do I want to feel instead versus, oh, I'm just going to not feel this way anymore. So when she said that, I was just like, huh, I never really thought about that before. So if I feel, say I feel angry and, and I think, okay, well, how do I want to feel instead? I want to feel loved. Okay. What are three things I could do right now that choices that I have that would get me closer to feeling loved? And it now gives me direction. So if I just don't want to feel that way, I can either numb it out and keep making the same choices or, you know, respond in a way that really isn't helpful because maybe I've tried that before and it didn't work. So what could I, what are three different things I could do that will actually get me toward what I want versus avoiding what I don't want. And it just like blew my mind. I don't know if anyone else can relate to that, but for me, it was like, huh, whoa. And the more choices that we're making that are in alignment, with what matters to us, the more of the right people we have in our lives, you know, the more, um, the better energy we have, the more we start to attract the people we do want in our lives to us and repel those that don't see us as this victim, you know. So it takes a lot of awareness and practice of awareness of what is it that I'm feeling right now and what can I feel instead to give that direction and it's a life changer, you know, it is a life changer and it goes back to fire in the belly. You know, what's, what's going to give me the fire in the belly? Well, it's not avoiding what I don't want. It's what do I want instead, right? Like what's going to give me that fire? What's going to light me up? And until we find a way to start using that for direction, it's just a matter of avoiding and enduring life. So those are some things that, you know, when when you think you don't have a choice, life can certainly suck. I'm not suggesting that there aren't bad circumstances and people have gone through some major traumas. Right. So, you know, abuse and things like that, where I don't have control over that. Right. Um, I'm not suggesting that it's more. OK, I've had this experience. What do I want? my life to be like versus, you know, just living in that accepting, you know, there is an acceptance, right? Okay, it happened, happened. And now what? And do I allow that to control me for the rest of my life? Or can I take a teensy tiny little baby step that will get me a little closer 
to what I want to feel. And so it doesn't have to be some big solution. It doesn't mean that you're whole again when something ripped you to shreds. Um, it just means what's a teensy tiniest thing that I could do that's a move toward the way I want to feel. And it's it's a game changer. I mean, even if people just want to try it, um, give it a chance. It's amazing. Like it can really change state pretty quickly. I mean, for you, and, and it's really interesting there, obviously, you know, looking at looking at your options differently. I mean, how much of it is, though, that do you need to observe the behavior? So, but like you were saying, I mean, if it's, if we're noticing this, you know, whether we notice or somebody else knows, it's kind of going, yeah, you can have a habit of doing this. It's like, no, I don't. It's like, okay. <laughs> this, yeah, this, okay. I'm, I'm maybe starting to see a pattern. I mean, how, how important is it to observe that pattern to, to enable to change? Or do you think it is all forward facing? Um, well, so in, in consulting, in change management, they teach um, this methodology called ADCAR. And it, it's, um, it's awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement. And it all starts without awareness you can't build desire. It just oh, you, with, with trying to get knowledge to get out of it, there's a human behavior to always go back to the way you've always been. So if you're learning how to do it, you're not in a state of mind to absorb the knowledge yet because you don't have the awareness to know what to pay attention to. And same thing with, you know, you keep going down, right? Ability, you can't get better at something if you don't know how to do it. And you can't reinforce a good behavior if you don't know what behavior to be reinforcing. So, so that awareness piece, um, there are different things you could do to get to that level, but it is absolutely 100% required to get all the way through the process of really building desire to the point where you know what to learn to be able to absorb it. And so to get to awareness, it's a, a diff first of all, it's listening to shows like this, right? hearing the right thing at the right time, surrounding yourself with things that can help draw that out, just hearing other people's stories, which I imagine is part of your mission, right? Why you do what you do, is you recognize the power of hearing other people's stories, because we can relate to others. So even if we can't see it in our own life, if we see or hear what others are going through and we're like, hey, you know, like that, there's another person on this planet that's dealing with that. Wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. Or, wow, they're really brave. Or, that's interesting. How did they come to that awareness? And they'll tell their story. So it's just surrounding yourself with the resources that can help when you know awareness is so important and it's not avoidance. There's a, you know, if you're looking for awareness and not just knowledge of how to get out of your situation, then you start to build the capacity to absorb the next piece and to build the next piece. So it's all kinds of things. It's well, it goes back to what what feeling do I want to have instead and what could I do to get closer to that? You don't have to know how to do it, but what are resources available? You know, what choices can I make? I could choose to listen to fire in the belly today or every day, right? I could listen to that because I know that that's helpful. I could seek out a professional. I could, you know, look at coaching. I could look at programs that are out there that have helped other people that feel like me um, right now. So it's knowing that awareness is that critical and being resourceful of how can I find the answer? And it, when I don't have the answer, or if I don't know what I'm doing, that's creating this rut, you know, do the rut exercise, something like, you know, what are the choices that I am making? What are the things that keep creating that cycle? And what are choices that I could try that are different? Because it can help us get out of that same way of thinking, because it feels automatic. So if you're getting the same result that you don't like, it's taking a moment to say, okay, so what about this that keeps happening? What's the pattern? where do I have a choice point in the pattern? And of those choice points, is there anything I could be doing differently? 
or if I just don't know how, if I know that I'm probably doing something that I don't even know, then I'm going to go find somebody who can give me some some input. You know, one thing that I thought was an interesting exercise I did in one of my programs that I um, learned from was to reach out to 10 people that you know and have them describe you. Say, how do you, how do you, how would you describe me? And it's fascinating. Like if you do a, a different, all kinds of different people, like right? you could do it for your boss, you could do it for your colleague, you could do it for your best friend, you could do it for just random people. You'd be surprised at how many people want to tell you what they think of you. <laughs> um, and just having an open mind. And it's really uh, fascinating. And people that you've known for a long time pick up on stuff about you that you're like, really? Think that about me? That's amazing. I had this friend of mine that um, I had known since sixth grade. It's the last time I lived with her, you know, in the same neighborhood. And I moved, I was living in San Diego. We would see each other every other year. I moved up to Sacramento. We'd see each other every year until, you know, life took over um, and we got into college. And then I like never saw her for like 10 years. And then we reconnected. And so we didn't really she didn't know me know me I didn't think I mean since sixth grade right and then these random in between stories but there was a time where she goes you know what I talk about you all the time like, why she said because I know that if you decide you want something you figure it out and I'm like really I never really thought of myself as you know no matter what I'm gonna find my solution I just thought well I'm just gonna I gotta get through this but she didn't see it that way she saw it as when you decide that that's what you want, it's the fire in the belly, right? When you decide that you want something, you get it. You figure it, you find a way, as, as ridiculous as it sounds, <laughs> you find a way. And I was thinking, well, you don't even know that I didn't really have a choice. Like I just had to get through it. But that's in reality, that's not true because there are a lot of people that don't get through it. So we do have choices and to give ourselves some credit for the strength, right? The people that are listening right now, there are a lot of things that you've done, likely not taking credit for, for yourself, that is strength that you had to muster. Like you had to not be a pile on the floor. You had to get yourself off the floor. You had to not stay where you were in order to be even capable of listening to this show. So we don't really give ourselves credit for the things that we are already doing that are getting us out of worse circumstance or surviving something awful. Um, so it's interesting when you get other people's perspectives, because I didn't really think of it that way. And you hear all kinds of different things. So when you do that, it also gives you an awareness of, huh, well, maybe there are things about me that I didn't realize I did have strength around or, wow, I don't want them to think of me like that. I'm going to do something different or, you know, Maybe everybody thinks I'm this Eeyore and I think I'm this positive person, but in reality, they're like, oh, well, you know, you're fine. But nobody says, oh, you're this light. Yeah. So it gives you something else to be able to reflect on. And sometimes it does like you're like, that person's a jerk. I don't think that person. That, I don't want that person in my life anymore. <laughs> so you get a, you learn about them and you can learn about yourself. So it's those types of things, right? What resources do I have available to me to learn something I don't know about myself that if I'm con continuing to have the same experiences that I don't want, there's something that I'm doing. Life isn't just dealing us the same deal. There are things that we're doing, circumstances that we're putting ourselves in, people that we're surrounding ourselves with, people or, you know, um, even choices of what to watch on TV, right? It's, I have a choice of what I'm going to put into my body and my brain. And I have a choice of what to listen to, what not to listen to, what's, what's giving me um, a better experience of life versus what's reinforcing the crappy part. You know, it's like news. I did this thing this morning. I'm like, why am I doing this? I don't do this. I was reading, I get one email about the news because I don't watch the news. But I thought, well, I have to be some sort of like responsible about knowing something if I'm going to be <laughs> doing programs. I do need to have an awareness of like what's going on in the world. And so I have this one email that gives, you know, the daily rundown of anything that matters, supposedly. 
And it was like nothing positive. It was all this horrible stuff. And ever, there's never anything happy in there. Like one, never, ever. And um, if it is, it's like at the bottom of the email, right? It's after all this horrible stuff we just heard about that's happening and how horrible people are and what dumb decisions people are making and how we're all going down. And um, it's I'm like, this is not good for me. Like, I'm just going to, I'm never reading this again. And I unsubscribed because it's like, you know what? This, I'll figure it out. Somebody else will tell me if something bad's happening. I'll just, you know, learn when I want to learn and get informed in other ways, but know that this is not a platform that is helpful to me. So it's all kinds of things like that, where just again, baby steps, you know, it's not a big step. If we feel like we have to solve everything to take a step, we're never going to take a step. It's what's the tiniest thing that I have the capacity to do that I could do right now. I kind of, um, I relate it to a lot of people have this challenge of, oh, I should go to the gym and, you know, why don't I go to the gym or I really should be healthy, you know, the shoulds. People do a lot of shoulds. I should do this. I should do that, which is not a fire in the belly. <laughs> uh, you know, it might get you started, but it's not going to fuel you and keep you going. So it's, how do you get the shoulds out and create it into a want? How do you shift a should into a want? Well, why do you think you should do it? Oh, well, because that's the only way to do this thing. Okay, well, what is it about that outcome that you think getting, you know, going to the gym is going to give you? What is it that you think that should is going to do that it's become a should? Oh, well, it's going to help me feel healthy. Okay, so you want to feel healthy. All right, so if you want to feel healthy, going to the gym could help you feel that way. Sure. Well, do you want to go to the gym? No. Do you want to feel healthy? Yes. Okay, what could I do that I want to do that could also be another decision instead of going to the gym? And then people say, well, but I do want to go to, I do want to go to the gym, but I'm just not going. Okay, well, how about this? And I do this analogy and men are like, yeah, that wouldn't apply to me. <laughs> A version of this for you. But for women, it's like, okay, well, what, maybe all I can muster is I'm going to go get a cute sports bra. That's my action for today. And then tomorrow I'm going to get the cute pants. And then the next day I'm going to get the cool shoes. And then by day four, I've got this amazing outfit that I can't wait to wear. And so I really want to go to the gym. You know, it's like getting a good playlist. Oh, I can't wait to listen to this playlist. I'm going to go run on the treadmill. So how do you shift a should into a want? But it's baby things. You don't have to just make yourself go to the gym. Like what's going to make you want to go to the gym? It seems like a, not a big deal, but it actually is a significant, significant difference in the way we think about what we're choosing to do or not choosing to do. Which, which for you is a bigger driver then? Is it, is it pain or pleasure? I mean. Um, the techniques that I use are, okay, so why do you want it? And what if I don't do it? And so it's a combination and it goes back to awareness, right? Like I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday who was in a, in a spot where, um, you know, convinced that, you know, if they do one more thing, I'm leaving. I'm like, okay, well, what's going to be your thing that's going to be your resolve? What is it that's going to make sure? Oh, well, I'm just, you know, and I do this with love in case she's listening. Like this is all in love. It's not a judgment because I've been there and that's the only reason I could relate to her, but um you know but what if they say something nice you know what if they have another reason you know what is it that's going to keep you from staying again what's what's going to get you to get out of a situation you're in resolve right now when you know your heartstrings not getting pulled or when some circumstance comes up and um she's like well i'm just i'm i know i don't want to do this i'm like well why not she's like i just know i don't want this anymore I'm like but why don't you want it? Like, what happens if you stay? Because we think about, we're going to leave because it's better. But what happens if I stay? If it's just, oh, well, life's going to suck. Well, let's get a little bit more real than that. Like, what's going to happen to your kids? What's life like if you stay? Like, what's it going to be? What are you, what's life like 10 years from now? Where are you? Is your spirit still alive? You know, is it even possible to have a fire in the belly? Not if you keep living like that. So, so it's a really a combination of things. I don't think you can have one and not the other because 
when we want to get out of something that's to escape pain, right? But if something happens where that person now all of a sudden that maybe isn't good for us does something that makes us feel less pain in that moment. Well, we have to remember the pain of staying if, you know, and think like really think about that before you wait for that moment to happen, like, to have that in your back pocket. <laughs> so when we do um, values with my program, oh, it's interesting, it goes back to words again, you know, so I use the word values and he was like, values is a trigger for me. Like it shuts me down. I don't want to think about values. I've done that, didn't work. So it's like, okay, well, what could work for you? How about, you know, treasures? It's like, oh, I could do treasures. That works for me. Treasures, that works for me. Now I'm good. Like I could think about the treasures in my life. <laughs> That's so interesting when we shut ourselves off with one word. Okay, what could turn us back on? Same concept, same thing. But what could we call it differently? That's why I call it journey fuel. And I call it creating a map, not a strategy. And I create what destinations do you want to go to versus what your goals are, you know? So it's dissociating the pain of, of the stuff that you know is good for you that you don't want to do. Well, how can I shift it into something that is pleasurable? So it's this combination of knowing when you're in pain and knowing what you want it to be like from a pleasure perspective and really weighing the two. So it comes back to when you know what's really important to you, it can't just be because you know it's important to you. It needs to also be, well, what happens if you don't have that in your life? What is life going to be like? not today, but like literally like tomorrow and five years from now and 10 years from now, like if you stay or if you aren't living this value or if you don't have this treasure in your life, then what? You know, what if you're not in pain right now, what pain are you going to be in? And it's that that, you know, isn't a maybe it's like going to happen. You know, it's going to be painful. And until you can bring that into reality while you're in a state of choice, then you know you need both like you really need to have both and to answer your question even more specifically it'd be if i find that i want something different than what i have now and i can tap into what feeling do i want to have instead and i could say okay well then why am i not changing do i not have a strong enough why it's one of two things i don't have a strong enough why that i want to change um and then a strong enough why of what I don't want to have. Here's what I want to have instead. And here's what I know I don't want. Because if I don't, if I, if I don't have this thing in my life, my life is going to be like this and the pain that I'm going to have in that, in that moment. So that's how you can use that is, well, if, if pleasure isn't working, then we need to find a way to make what we don't like right now more painful and realize the pain of it versus just focusing on what could be better. You know, it's really about both. If you're not changing, it's not painful enough to stay the same. So it's kind of, it's really not one or the other in my experience. I was gonna say, how do, how do you get people out of that stage? You know, do, do, we, do we have to go through the breakdown for the breakthrough or can you, you know, how, how often can people sort of question your, their own truth long enough to actually do something about it or do we need to wait right. till it all falls apart you know and as you say you have that yeah. you have that sort of ugly cry moment you know and it just it has to get there right yeah sometimes you know sometimes we have to have that experience sometimes we we have well have to sometimes it takes getting that experience um and sometimes it's having that experience enough times to want to get out of it. And then in my own personal experience, I've never had an experience of not having that. <laughs> there have definitely been moments. I mean, the only way I got out of mine was when it got so bad um, that I didn't want to live 40 more years. Like, I mean, I wasn't in a place of doing something about that. You know, I wasn't in a suicidal place, but I was crying every day, wondering what the hell this was all about. You know, and I had kids like, what's their life going to be like if their mom is like this you know and why would i what do i want for them like is this going to be their life well no you know so but so i was in that place i think sometimes it's having known that place that we can draw on to know that there is such a thing as like real 
live pain that once we've experienced that we could use that to our advantage to not have to let ourselves get to that place or not to have to wait for it to get that bad and it comes back to awareness um, and how do you want to feel instead and what can you do now so that you don't have to keep feeling that or or um in the in the idea of of value so for me my tight-knit family life immersion um freedom and abundance vitality um uh unwavering faith and self-expression and um let's see i have one more oh making a difference <laughs> oh making a difference those are my core seven and so when we create those in the programs that I teach, it's okay, so let's get clarity on that. We go through the whole feelings thing. We come up with what is in our lives that would give us that and start to look for the themes to find out what is it, what are like our core seven are. And then from there, in the same program, we're saying, okay, so why do you want that? And what if you don't have it? What's life going to be like? So you're doing it at the same time when you're creating what is it that really matters and thinking about it now so that when you get closer to that when you're not showing up with that value when you're noticing you're not living in alignment with that you can remember okay if i keep doing this it's going to get to the point where i'm going to have these things that i don't want and making it powerful enough vivid enough descriptive enough to be able to really relate you know, I use visualizations and in, in the things that I you know programs with the folks that I have when like my walk the talk weekend program is the foundational program of it's how to walk the talk. You know, in two and a half days we focus on clarity, which is day one we're getting clear on the values day two is all about certainty and that's building the why does it matter so much like testing it like litmus test on is it a should is this a should. <laughs> or you know is it for real and. So why do I want that? And what happens if I don't? And building that with such certainty that you know there is no negotiating, like that's what matters. And then day three is about the tools and techniques and activation of now how do you walk it? Like, so now you got your talk. Now how do you walk it? And it's not a judgment. It's what tools and techniques don't you have right now that you could use when you start to pick up on these things are out of alignment. How do you know when you're out of alignment before it gets so bad that you're realizing the things that you don't want? So it's a matter of awareness and a matter of desire and a matter of knowledge. And then once you have the knowledge, it's practicing and getting the ability or going to the people that can teach you how to do it. And then when you know it, setting things in place to reinforce that. And reinforcing means getting it up front what when I what what if I notice I'm going to slip, you know, if I'm starting to slip, how am I going to know I'm slipping? What does it look like when I am living this value? What behaviors am I engaged in? What are the things I'm in control of? What are the things I'm doing so that you can regularly check in with yourself and say, hey, am I doing these things? Because I'm not really feeling tight knit family right now. Like, how would how have I already decided in in this weekend that here's what it looks like when I do live it? And you could check in. Am I doing that? Not really. I could do this one thing. Okay, I'm going to do that. Or, you know, if you're starting to feel the things that you know are happening because you're not living in alignment, you now have a barometer that you can say, okay, this is happening. I don't want this to happen. What can I do to get myself back on track? And it's, well, how can I behave instead? Or how can I, what choices can I put in place now? You know, it's like when you want to get healthy, you know, what do I know is my weakness? Well, I'm always going for the junk in the house. So what could you put in place right now? You know, okay, fine. We don't have any junk, right? Which, you know, sometimes we just need some junk. But um, I used to do this program called Body for Life. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's kind of old school, Bill Phillips from way back in the day. And it's not cheating on the seventh day. You get six days of eating healthy and working out, and the seventh day is eat whatever you want, and he calls it free day. It's not cheating. People are like, oh, it's cheat day. No, no, no. It's part of the program. You're supposed to eat unhealthy on the seventh day. But so then I have all this junk in my house on the seventh day, right? And then I'm supposed to go back to eating healthy again the next day. 
And so I realized, well, if I keep the junk, then I have a really hard time going back. So I get the junk, eat as much as I could that day, and then throw it out so that by Monday, it's not there anymore. So it's like, what are the weaknesses? What are the things that could go wrong? And how can I put something in place that'll help get in the way of it going wrong? Or if I, what can I do when I know I'm there and already have a plan, kind of a backup plan when you hit that spot? How for you do you do you check your own truth? How, how do you make sure that, you know, some people need to be an outside influence to check their own language, to check that, mm -hmm. you know, maybe their truth is not the truth, you know, or, or whatever yeah. version of it or, or you know, self-reflect. I mean, is that something you've been able to work on? Is it something that you're able to do yourself or do you, you know, to, is it more important for you to actually get an outside perspective on yourself? So what I do is, and this is a, this changed me. This is what I created when I was getting out of my situation a decade ago was once I had my values or my treasures, my core seven, every decision I made, I litmus test against those things. So everything. So do I go home right now or do I stay at work longer? Well, how does that line up with the things that matter to me? Well, tight-knit family is important to me, but so is freedom and abundance. So if I stay, then is it going to help me in my career? If I don't stay, what's going to, you know, what's going to happen from a career perspective or from an abundance perspective? And then I look at, okay, but what if I stay and tight-knit family matters to me and then I don't see my kids? Well, what if I go, you know, what if I go home? Is that really going to make that big of a difference? You know, helps you weigh your choices. So in that case, let's say, well, if I don't stay and I want to go home and see my kids, then what's the impact of, of going home and seeing my kids? What's really going to happen? Like, am I really going to lose my job? Am I really going to, you know, not be able to finish tomorrow? And, but then if I go home, am I really going to be present with my kids? Or am I just going to go home and sit there? And then I might as well have been at work. So it helps you really think through every decision that we're making. And the more we do it, the more practice we get, it just becomes part of breathing. You know, it's just part of what I do. So one of the things that I use, I don't call it a to-do list. To-do list is like a bad word. To-do list and should and have to and can't, you know, those are all bad words. So to-do list can be such a trigger for people. Oh, now it's a should. So um, I used to call it like an activity list or an activity, you know, itinerary for the day. And I was doing a program, and I love this about my program. So it was a walk a talk weekend. And I had told folks, you know, pick a word that works for you, or here's the thing, you know, if there's something else. And somebody said, well, what if we call it a playlist? Her name is Ann Carbone to put it out there and give her full credit. She's like, let's call it a playlist. Like, oh my gosh, that's totally the word. Playlist, that's what it is. So now I call it a playlist. And that in and of itself is giving us a litmus test. Like, could I actually call this a playlist? Like, is this legit? You know, if I have to take out the trash, is that really a to do or is that, you know, something that I want to do? And then it's like, well, what if I don't take out the trash? Well, then my house is going to smell. If my house smells, then I'm not going to want to be in it. And then I'm not going to have my environment, which means I'm not going to have vitality. And I totally go through that. Like, I want to take out the trash now. That's part of playing because I know if I take that out, then I'm going to have an environment that feels good. So it's practicing that. And so there's every single decision every single day. And I don't put anything on my playlist that I haven't litmus test against my core seven. So if it doesn't line up, it doesn't go there. Gone, delete. And if I feel like I can't delete it, then I really need to look at my life and be like, well, really? Because if I really can't delete this from, you know, if I can't turn this into a playlist item, because it doesn't line up with my values. Why am I doing it? Like, what do I need to shift out of? So in and of itself, that does it. And then also, as you get, you know, baby steps, right? That's a baby step. And then going forward, another thing you can work work in is like each week, right? You're looking at your week, you know, picking a day of what's my week going to look like? And what are some of the things that I'm going to be doing? And how can I, you know, see how did I do last week? How in alignment was I, you know, did I really follow through on stuff? What can I do this week that would be more in alignment? Or, you know, every month we do the same thing. You can look back and say, how'd it go? 
you know, and then I have a bunch of different techniques that I teach where one of them is you can look at, you know, you think of it like a pie chart, you put in your, your core values and you kind of plot how you're doing against each one. And if you're way off on one, say, okay, well, what can I do to focus on this one thing right now? And this week, maybe I pick something that is going to help me with that one. I do a little bit more of that. So it's a way of thinking through where am I in terms of living it? What am I not living? What could I put more of in my week this week or in my day this today? And it just creates that compass. So it's helping, it, it does that check. And when you, it goes back to that reinforcement piece, right? Like what things can you put in place? Like, you know, mile markers or things that you can go, when you get to a certain point, you're gonna check, how am I doing? And before it gets too far down the path, it's like looking at a fuel gauge, right? In a car, if you never look at the fuel, you're gonna run out of gas. So you're kind of looking at that, you know, what is that called? An odometer? What is that thing called? Whatever that is, that little needle thing. Yeah, um, your speed too. Yeah, your speed, your um, gas levels, right? Like if you're if you're uh, running out of gas, it's the same thing. Like you're checking that that piece on your dashboard. So your fuel tank is like one of those things. So if I'm never looking at that, I'm I'm going to be missing out on something. So it's kind of like using your values as your gas tank check. You know, am I looking at them enough to know if I'm off before it gets too late? Is that something, I mean, you know, and I get it, you know, taking it, filtering it through your value set, but I mean, is, is there times when you have to take input from those around you to say, you know, you say that the feedback from those that are nearest and dearest, you know, how much, how much credence do you give to that? Cause people would say, well, listen, yeah, you know, the whole Henry Ford thing. If you ask people what they wanted, they'll just give you a faster horse, not a car, you know, and that's that aspect of, do they really know they, they have yeah. a, a perception of you. Right. So I suppose it's, it's yeah, you know, absolutely. Well, and that's why I have a coach, you know, every coach has a coach, you know, good coaches keep learning and, and, um, you know, you can't leave, read the label from inside the jar, right? You've got to have other perspectives in life. So it's when you think about the resources that you have available to you and planning for what's going to help me be and live that life experience, what would be in my life to keep me doing that? What things can I have available to me? And one of them is an outside perspective or continuously learning things, listening to things, you know, trying to you see what resonates. And um, absolutely, I, I, I remember when I was getting out of my marriage and um, I, I like set up a board. <laughs> this is before I took that coaching class of how to do this for myself. But I was like, I'm gonna have a board, you're on my board. So I had like a, a board of like six people that I said, when I start to date somebody, we're all going to have a conversation <laughs> and you guys can help me make a decision on, is this the right person? Am I like going back into my old ways? You know, if you know of what you know about me, what's your opinion on this? But I didn't have just one person. I needed like multiple perspectives because if one person has their own version, right, they can all see different things. So it was like, okay, well, I respect this person for this reason. And I know that they're going to pick up this part of me. And I know this person's going to pick up on like fun. This person's going to pick up on like responsibility. You know, and this person knows me so well that they'll know if my light's going out, you know? So it's, it is kind of like a board of life. You know, who are the people that you could check in with or that will call you out or, you know, I remember when I was like near the end of getting out of my marriage, um, my best friend who I had known, I mean, we used to show up with the same outfits on and we lived cross country. And, you know, we were those people that we knew each other really well and even just kind of had the same taste that we didn't even realize, literally like the same shoes from 10 years ago, we'd have this like same exact outfit on. For my baptism for my daughter, I showed up with the Banana Republic skirt on that was pink and she had the exact same skirt that was in blue. Like, how have it? So we were on this wavelength, right? So some of us have those people. But when she told me that she's like, you're a zombie, like there's no light in your eyes. Gone. You know, when somebody like that tells you that your light is out, that kind of hits home. It's like, well, yeah, it kind of is. 
And um, so even though I kind of knew it, but it's like she was on me about it. She's like, you know, your your light is gone. And she said it, like she told me. But then also at the same time, after I got divorced, I had people congratulating me. Like at people at work, even people at work that I'd only met them like one or two times. Like, oh, thank God. What? What? How do you know that? Like, well, we weren't going to tell you when you were in it because you weren't going to listen to us. You wouldn't have heard it. You know, you're on their side. You want to make, you don't want people to think badly about them or, or, you know, you just can't see it. I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me? And he's like, well, you probably wouldn't have heard us. You know, so it's that balance. Like, do we tell people? Do we not tell people? Are they in the right state of mind? Like, I really wish some people would have said something, but at the same time, maybe I wouldn't have heard it. So sometimes it's just, getting so clear on knowing yourself and knowing what you want and really being real about how you're feeling and like instead of just avoiding feeling that way how do you want to feel instead and like being you know legit with yourself of it what is life like if i don't do something like we know in a sense right because even when i look back at the things that that i went through and in, in my relationship i mean it's very emotionally abusive very emotionally abusive to the point where like I was looking at I was in the grocery store once and I was going to buy waffles and I couldn't remember which waffles he liked. I couldn't remember did he hate blueberry and we've been married for 10 years. I couldn't remember like he either hated it or he loved it. I couldn't remember. I didn't buy waffles for very, very often and I was I stood there for like five minutes because I didn't want to call him. So I knew if I called him he was going to tell me how could I possibly not know after 10 years of marriage, you don't know how selfish can you be that all you care about is knowing what you want. You don't know what I want after 10 years. That's, I knew that's what I was going to hear. And so, you know, like coming home from Taco Bell, if I didn't check the order and his thing was missing, you know, you always, you always have what you want when you get home from there, but I don't have what I want. You didn't care enough to think about checking to see if the stuff that I had, like, you just don't care, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, geez, <laughs> but that was so normal that I just was fearful of even bringing it up if I didn't know something, um, you know, or if I did something that would never go away. When we were dating, I remember ordering um, at Taco Bell. Taco Bell's a big thing in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's my first job out of college or out of high school. Are you a bit um, of a foodie by chance? So, it, huh? Are you a bit of a foodie by chance? Say what? I guess in my own version, like food enough to not be hungry. But um, so I had ordered something and I said, did I just order a taco or a burrito? And I couldn't remember. That was when we were dating for my entire marriage. If we got in an argument. And I said, well, but you said this. He goes, what do you know? You don't even know if you ordered a taco or burrito. You don't know anything. You don't remember anything. How are you going to tell me that you know what I said when you can't even remember what you ordered at Taco Bell? That was when I was like 22. <laughs> you know, then I'm like 35 and I'm still living this hell of not knowing what I ordered at Taco Bell. So, you know, it's like that stuff where if I had known about well, I don't want to feel like this anymore. How do I want to feel instead? And what is something that I could do? Or how long am I going to put up with this? Or what can I put in place if I'm not strong enough to do it myself? Or if I'm not seeing it, but I know this continuously happens, um, what can I put in place? I just didn't know. You know, I didn't know the tools and techniques. I mean, my dad used to do that to my mom. So I was used to that. Like, I just thought that's what you were supposed to do. You just be quiet. You don't get yelled at, you know? Um, I didn't know there was something better. And so it's about exposing ourselves. Okay, so is this really how it is for everybody? Like, is everybody not allowed to make a mistake? There are people out there that actually, you know, maybe they do have better relationships. <laughs> you know, and just learning and being curious about, you know, is it a fact that I have to live like this? Like, is this for real? Or am I just saying to myself that, it's it's easier to just deal with this than you know to try to get out because of the hell i mean it wasn't easy for me to get out of that i mean i he took everything 
I gave them everything. I gave them all my money. I gave them, you know, I pay for my kids. I pay for life insurance in case I die to pay for my kid's college. So he's on my life insurance policy. I mean, all that stuff. I just wanted to get out, you know, and my friends were like, well, why didn't you just go to court? Why did, why did you do that? Said, because I just wanted it over. I'd rather be broke and in my own life than be in court for two more years because I knew how he was going to be. So it's kind of like knowing what do you want your life to be like and what what's worth giving up or what's worth um, fighting for and is it like questioning that, you know, because I have another friend who's going through a divorce and it is hell. Like she just doesn't want to give up on anything and I get it. You know, when we're angry or somebody's done something to hurt us and we want them to pay, I get that. And she has her version of what her life would be like if she didn't fight for it, you know. Um, and for her, it's really important because she knows if she doesn't, then she's going to have regrets or whatever. And in my scenario, it was, you know what, I would rather just move on and give them whatever that has to be and have peace now because I... You know, it was um, when we were in the middle, and I'm sharing this in case this is going to resonate with anybody. You sometimes hearing what other people have, you're like, huh, yeah, that is kind of horrible. But um, when I was look, trying to get a divorce and going through that process, and we had money in the bank, and I think we had like, which is weird, the time. I was saving it for taxes. So I, um, I had put money away in a separate account that was for taxes, not really money to spend, it was for taxes. And he calls me and I'm on my way somewhere, I don't know what it was, and he's like, yeah, I need half of that money, half of that money is mine, we're not divorced yet. And I'm like, well, it's really not, it's Uncle Sam's, it's not mine. It's like, well, you either put half of that into our checking account or I'm going to destroy your ability to make partner. I'm gonna talk about all the things, I'll tell them all these things, I'll, I'll bankrupt you. I won't talk to you anymore. I'll take you to court for everything and I'll just bankrupt you and you'll never make partner. Because I wouldn't transfer money that was for taxes, you know, like that was him. So I knew if I fought and went to court, that was going to be two years of hell. I just knew. So I'd rather go broke down, like give him everything and have peace and let him have his thing. Um, and there's a choice. You know, that was my choice. And then people would judge me on that. Well, what'd you do that for? You just caved again. I'm happy. I'm not, I'm not in court. I'm not stressed every day. You know, whereas my friend, if she would have done that, she couldn't live with herself. Like she wanted to get what she deserved because he had hurt her, which I get. So each person has their own version of what it means to get out of a situation that isn't healthy. And, you know, I would just encourage people to kind of goes back to what should you do versus what is it that you want your life experience to be you know what feelings do you want to have what could you do that could get you closer to that and you know i think people who've lived in emotionally abusive relationships can question their own choices because they were trained to question their own choices you know well am i just being an idiot i don't know maybe i'm making a bad choice maybe i shouldn't do that maybe you know um and that's when it kind of goes back to where feelings can be really powerful is, well, this is how I'm feeling. And I want to feel this way instead. I want to feel empowered. I want to feel strong. I want to feel confident in my choice. And if you just can't feel confident, what's something I can do to feel more confident? If I don't trust myself, who could I go to that I trust that could give me guidance? You know, if I didn't know an answer to that, I could go to a professional, I could go to a lawyer, I could go to, you know, someone that I know won't judge me, a friend of mine, you know. So it's if you don't know how to get to how you want to feel instead, or if you don't trust your own choices, what could you do to get more trust in yourself? You know, a baby, 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 baby steps and try and catch ourselves when we're really getting judgmental because in reality the judgment that we're feeling is a feeling that we're choosing to have you know it's not, sometimes it's hard to think about it that way but it's real i mean if we're afraid of what people are going to think then what do we care <laughs> what's that person's life like do we want to live that person's life probably not like the person that's judging us that we care so much about like they don't have to be there every day 
they don't have to wake up next to that person. They don't have to go to that job. They don't have to, you know, not be the who they want to be in front of their kids. Like, that's not their life. So what do they care? Well, they don't have any skin in this game. What do I care? And they and most people really don't know because you probably haven't told people because you probably maybe aren't at a, some of us aren't at a level of awareness of really how bad it is. I mean, I used to tell my mom, I'm like, she would be, I'm so sorry you had it that way. I said, you had it worse than I did. I did, and he was fine. I'm like, no, 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 no. It was worse. Like if she, I used to tell my mom to keep a journal of each day that she got yelled at. And she didn't do it, but I was like, if you did that, you would have something written down at least every day. And, and if not every day, if you, maybe you wouldn't realize it, there wouldn't be a week that would go by that you weren't going to have something written down for 47 years, you know? Um, so people may not realize, you know, cause you're just surviving. You're just surviving in that situation. So I just encourage people that if you are having feelings you don't want to have to pick one, don't pick them all, pick one. How do you want to feel instead? And if you just don't feel like you have the capacity to feel that way, come up with three ways that you could get closer to feeling like you could feel that way. You know, and I'm bawling snot on my nose, uh, you know, in the minivan. I couldn't even imagine feeling that way ever again. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't imagine that possibility. I couldn't connect to it. Um, but I was now aware. So it was in my brain. And that's why I think watching that movie resonated because I had had that moment where I was paying attention. So it could be as simple as hearing things that they're learning on your show and testing them You know, try it. If you're not happy, if you're having feelings of fear or, you know, um, in a situation that's not safe or, you know, what could you do? And then, and just keep brainstorming until you come up with something even if it's talking to somebody or reading a book because you're afraid to talk to somebody or something, you know, that could get you a little closer to having what you want to have instead. It's really powerful. I mean, are, are you clear in sort of the original? Because I mean, a, a lot of that I would imagine are, are symptom behaviors, you know, so we're aware mm -hmm. of our symptoms, but are, are you aware, and I'm not necessarily asking you to reveal them, but are you, are you uh -huh. clear in the causes of that behavior and, and, you know, why you were sort of seeking the people you were seeking, why you were connecting in that right. way, why you were behaving that way? Oh, it took a lot of therapy. <laughs> um, but what was interesting is that sometimes it's getting the right Sometimes well, I did, I did therapy for seven years, it took me therapy for seven years. So I had a lot of training and I actually thanked the woman afterwards in tears. I'm like, thank you for not giving up on me. Cause it took me that long to figure it out, <laughs> but I kept going. But the other thing is like, I did this other program where, um, about dating, you know, I did that program because I knew I didn't want to pick and it wasn't in that it really wasn't about dating. Um, and by the way, if anyone is in that situation, there's a podcast called Dating with Dignity by Marnie Batista, and it changed my world. Um, she's the one that I ended up hiring as, and you know, went going to her programs that changed my life completely. And it got me to that, like all these little tools and techniques that I've started to leverage in some of my courses and programs that I do is from stuff I've learned from other people. It's just how to apply it. You know, it's adding the consulting to how to integrate it into our lives. But I pick and choose all these little things that I'm learning from my own coaching. And um, it was a lot, it was all about becoming whole. It wasn't about how to pick a good guy. It was about wh who are you and what is it that is important to you to be whole? And what are kind of one of the things we did were what are five non negotiables? You know, what are five things that you want in somebody that are not negotiable? See, five things you'll never fight about. And, but it took, some exercises to get to where you could even get to that place, you know, in your head, like it was about healing our own pain um, in order to get to where you're healthy enough to see the patterns or to see some of these things and really look at, at what is it that's causing it. And there are all kinds of ways to do it. Bottom line is finding the resources that can help pinpoint that because in the end, we have to be healed to make good choices or on a path to healing, 
you know, before we can be confident in, in ourselves and trust ourselves. And it's just a matter of practice and the right resources. Um, it's available to us. Some of the, one of the techniques they did, which was interesting, and it's kind of might sound woo woo ish, but it was really interesting. As a therapist that that she had was part of her program as one of our coaches, and she did this thing called the little who's thinking about little who's, and it was about um, all of these little experiences of our lives at different different times. So when we were three, when we were seven, when we were twelve, you know, we have these little who's that were created uh, from an experience. So. For example, like, um, you know, if I'm feeling overwhelmed with a relationship or like or maybe angry about something or, or hurt by something, you could say, well, when was the first time I ever felt that way in my life? Like as far back as you could go. Um, you know, sometimes you can't go all the way back, but like sometimes you'll go right there. You know, oh, I was six. I was standing in this room and I remember or, oh, I was a teenager and this was happening. And it would be the first time you feel, felt that way, it's sort of like looking at trigger points, you know, what created the trigger, what created PTSD, you know, they do this with military, um, you know, going back to what, finding what triggered it a long time ago, what created that trigger that keeps getting triggered now, even though we're out of that circumstance. And so it's like, okay, well, when's the first time that I ever experienced that? What was the circumstance and why does it make perfect sense? then I'm feeling this way, you know, like if I don't want to speak up because I'll get yelled at, well, when's the first time that happened to me? Well, gosh, <laughs> probably four or seeing some happen to someone else. You know, I saw it happen to my mom. So it doesn't even have to happen to you, but like when, when is it that you first felt the fear or something uh, in that area? And to think about the circumstance, well, of course it makes perfect sense. I didn't want to get yelled at. I saw my dad yelling at my mom. Why would I want to put myself in that situation? And so that's why, you know, I'm afraid of someone yelling at me because of what I experienced when I was, you know, six. And so now you could say, okay, well, that makes perfect sense. And what we, what she taught us was, and I'm probably not going to do this full justice because I'm not trained in this. This is just what I learned <laughs> from this experience. But it's really interesting if you give it a chance. Um, was, okay, well, I was six and I didn't get something I needed then, or I was afraid of something. Well, what's different about now? You know, that person, a part of me, needs something that I ever got, or, or had something happen that I never want to have happen ever again. So it makes sense that I would think that way, but now that I'm an adult and I'm in my 30s, 40s, whatever, those same circumstances don't exist. Like those conditions, those people that my age, my level of knowledge, my level of life experience was different. So it makes sense that I would be afraid of that happening. But now I've got things that I can now know or do or have access, you know, access to resources I can find that I didn't have access to before. So to relate this circumstance right now to what created that originally is not reality, you know, it's, um, you know, it's like limiting beliefs, they'll call them, or, you know, is it true? Is it a fact that if I do this right now, this is going to happen? Not a fact, but it might, you know, or it probably will because blah, 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 blah. Okay, but it's not a fact. So if it's not a fact, then what are things that you have at your, you know, um, to make it so that it doesn't become a fact or is there a choice that you could make that's different or what do you know now that's going to make it so that no that's really you know the, the likelihood of that as much it's a different situation it's not a guaranteed thing or if it's a really high probability because it's happened so many times well what can you do differently what do you want to fill instead what are choices you can make that are different that could be a different outcome to try so it's not this inevitable thing because a lot of us that have had bad relationships with people whether men or women or whatever you know we've had these scarring experiences maybe we never want to be in a relationship ever again and i thought that for a long like what do i need that for i'm happy <laughs> i don't need to add drama like i don't need to make sure i'm not picking someone that's not good for me and it came down to, you know, well, what life experience do I want to have? And can I have that experience without experiencing 
you know, love from somebody or whatever it is, but it takes time to get there. So I think it's um, giving yourself some grace too of how, how much you have the capacity for right now, given the circumstance that you're in and knowing that you can build that over time. You know, the more you let go of, the more you release, the more you heal, the more room you have to make new choices and um, do more, you know, bigger things. But until then, you're just getting yourself to the next place so you can have the next level experience. But to think you're going to go from where you are now to, you know, like, I'll use my own terms. For me to think that I'm going to have a million dollars tomorrow, I mean, unless I do something pretty cool today, um, um, it might not happen tomorrow, but what can I do today that'll get that million dollars closer to me? And it could be tomorrow. Like maybe I make the right phone call today. You know, you never know. But um, as long as we're thinking about, well, what could get me closer to that? That's the way it's going to come to be. Otherwise, it's just, you know, pipe dream or hoping. What, what are you capable of, do you think? Um, in life? Like yeah. overall, um, the way I would define that. So my big thing that I've been focusing on since I had an epiphany not so long ago, um, well, I don't know. What, the more I do values stuff, the more I think about experience, the more I'm getting better at the feelings thing, the more I've gotten more, even more clarity on the experience of life that I want to have. And what I realized was, well, one of my core values used to be authenticity because that's something that was really important to me and I was something that I wanted to keep in my consciousness because I didn't know who I, I didn't feel like I knew who I was. Like I was just being who people that would have otherwise yelled at me wanted me to be so that I wouldn't get yelled at or that I wouldn't make stupid choices or, you know, I didn't really know Stacy. Um, and so I wanted to keep that where I could believe in that, that I could have authenticity. And now, I'm, I, that's changed to unwavering faith and self-expression because now I feel like I know how to live authentically, you know, authentically, and it's by following my soul and checking in with myself. And I've done a lot to get here. So um, it just takes taking steps until you can get to whatever readiness level that you're at. But for me, it's, I realized it's not about Oh, I need a purpose. I need a mission. I need to make a difference. It's I want to be here to be who I'm here to be. Um, I was put on the planet with a certain set of gifts, a certain circumstance that is going to enable me to be whatever personality, whatever, whatever effect, whatever um, accomplishment is put into my soul to have as long as I show up as who I was here to be. So as long as I'm being authentic, as long as I'm thinking through the things that I'm learning, as long as I'm living in alignment with my values and and um, showing up in a way that is authentic, then I get to experience life as that. And if I don't, then I don't. Like, how sad is that? It's kind of intense when I had that realization like if, if i don't live in alignment with my values i won't even know what it's like to feel like stacy like i don't even know what that is you know you think life sucks but it's like well but what would it be if we would have made different choices or if we make different choices what could life i won't even know what it's like to you know go to baskin robbins as myself Maybe I'd have picked a different flavor. I don't know. Maybe I would have a bigger light um, shining. I certainly would. Any of us would if we were living in a free way that other people would pick up on that and live their lives. So for me, what I feel like I'm capable of is I'm capable of continuously getting more and more and more authentic in my behaviors and actions and more focused on what I can do to feel the way I want to feel. And as an outcome, create a ripple effect. If I can make it so that I'm here living it who I'm here to be and extracting joy along the way and sharing it with others, then um, that automatically gives me purpose and gives my make a difference is just by doing what I have the capacity to do, the, the gifts that I have the ability to give 
um, the experience of life that I'm going to get to experience other people. I want to make that ripple effect of encouraging other people to do the same. And by doing that, that's, I mean, that's more capable than any of us could be individually. I mean, if you could create a ripple effect of people waking up to be who they're here to be, like that just kind of gets, again, I get really emotional about it because if you just do you, and if everybody listening just does them, the level of satisfaction, the level of fulfillment, the level of um, every kind of feeling would be at such a different experience of life that our energy would change. The people that we're attracting would change. The effect we have on other people would change. The ripple effect that we each have just by being who we are, what do we want the ripple effect to be? Do we want it to be negative? Do we want it to be positive? Do we just want it to be who we are? You know, um, I think about like, uh people think oh i want to make a difference what i, I don't know what i want to do how am i going to do that well if let's say you want to be a doc uh, you don't know if you want to be a doctor or not it could just be oh well i like science i'm going to go do this i'm going to see what happens oh wow cool i like that that's neat i'm going to go to med school oh now i'm in med school now i'm going to be a doctor and you're automatically making a difference because you liked science and you followed the path you're automatically going to be led to what it is that you enjoy doing the impact I mean artists can draw something and change somebody's experience somebody can say life's meant to be enjoyed not endured and change the entire experience of life for so many people and for me following my heart and living the experience I want to live I want to share with people what I've learned that changed my experience of life that got me to where I'm here to, to be who I'm here to be, live life as I'm here to experience life as, um, and extract joy along the way and share it with others, then I'm automatically doing that, creating this ripple effect. That's why I built Journey Fuel, is so that I can create programs to help people who don't love life, that don't, don't love waking up to their lives, that want to live a life they love waking up to because they know it's possible. I know what it's like to be completely overwhelmed to a state where you don't even know to your questions before, like how do you even know you're there? Um, I know what that's like, and I know I, I've found new ways that didn't exist in the marketplace of how to help people because of my consulting experience and because of the tools and techniques that I learned in that environment, coupling that with all the things that people are reading, all the things people want to do, um, and how to help them activate that that that's my ripple effect and the ripple effect that I can have just by doing that by activating, you know, it's like the wave at a stadium, you know, you can stand up, but it's when the next person stands up, and the next person stands up, it's like this amazing thing. And all we have to do is be who we're here to be. That's it. It's not that complicated. You know, it's like you doing this podcast, you're encouraging people to have a fire in their belly to find what it is that that lights them up, that gets them out of situations that um, they don't need to be in. That it can feel so overwhelming and so impossible sometimes. Sometimes you have to have that pain moment, like you said. Sometimes you have to have the breakdown. You know, I threw my Blackberry across the car once because I couldn't find a parking spot. Like, it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so I was at a state that I was just so overwhelmed and it did take some serious pain. Like the, I had a lot of things happen in my marriage that I didn't leave for that. I, and anybody on the outside looking in would be like, really? What's wrong with you that you wouldn't have left? You know, I guess I just wasn't there yet. Um, but if I would have known more, maybe it would have been different. Sometimes we have to go through certain things to know that that's what's got us out. So I think if people are in pain, if people are in scenarios that feel like they're trapped like okay what can you use what's the power you can get from that knowing that it's giving you fire knowing that you don't want that anymore like use it use it um use it to, to decide what are you not willing to stand for and then if you're not willing to stand for it what are you going to put in place to keep yourself strong I was telling my friend that yesterday it's like well what what can you put in place now that can be triggered when you are in a situation where you might be wavering? You know, what could you do right now knowing that there's a chance that you waver in your journey that could keep you from falling off the path? Um, 
you know, things like that. I did this thing where for me, uh, for women who have been pregnant and told that when they're having contractions to breathe and think and visualize this better place, which like, yeah, that's not happening in that moment. But that concept ended up being helpful to me later where when I, I'm a big water person, I'm a big ocean person. And so whenever I'm by the ocean, like I'm just, it's like Moana, you know, I feel like I'm connected. And um, it's like the one place I go to where I feel the whole world could just fall away and I feel like safe and connected. And uh, when I was going through getting out of my marriage, I was thinking through, okay, um, you know, it felt like an undertow, you know, when it would get really hard. It's like when, you, when you're when you out in the water in the ocean, if you guys have ever been far out enough in the ocean, when the, like, the undertow starts to come and like you're like literally getting pulled out to sea and you have a choice. If you don't start swimming, even if it's diagonally and not direct, right, like you are going to go out, you're gone. And so you got to move your way in. But as you get in, it gets even stronger. Like it gets even stronger, pulling you even harder to get out. And I remember thinking at times where it felt like that, like I felt like it's going to suck me back into, you know, abyss. And um, I had a choice to just let go and just let it take me because I was exhausted and tired. Like, do I want to keep going? Is it, am I... Is, am I ever going to make it to shore? What if I never make it and it's just all for naught? I'm just forget it. I'm just going to get up. But then the closer you get and the more resistance you have, then you finally can get to at least your feet are on the sand. You know, just get to, just let my feet get to the sand. You know, and then, you know, just a little more to where you can at least hold yourself up a little bit or put something in place that could keep you from falling backwards. Because once we if we just wait a little bit and let it like once we once we have our feet in the sand it could start to just let it pass and then it eases up completely and we just walk you know so how do we get there and i would think about that i would just close my eyes and i would visualize that undertow like i felt like the undertow and i thought if i let go right now i'm going to go further back than i even started with you know, like i started this i opened this can of worms right like <laughs> I told him I wanted to leave. I started him being pissed. Like, if I let go now, it's going to be even worse than when I didn't speak up, you know? And do I have the strength to come back? I don't think I do. Like, now that I know it's this hard, <laughs> I don't know if I'd come back, especially if I give up on myself. Will I ever have the faith in myself to do it again? You know, and I would close my eyes and I would think about that. And I would think, okay, I'm just going to get my feet into the sand. I get my feet in the sand, then I can let it pass a little bit and get more strength to keep moving forward. But I'm just not going to let go. I'm not going to let myself go all the way back. And so, so that was a visualization for me. And then when you hit the sand, it's like the most amazing feeling. You know, it's, there's no resistance. You're living the life. Like I would just imagine sand, like being on the sand. And um, it worked for me. So, for people who are going through something hard, it's like, what could work for you? Like, what's something that you can relate your pain to that can help you also be strong in those moments that you can go to mentally? And I would close, literally close my eyes and go there, you know, in tears. <laughs> um, like, is this worth it? Um, and having something to go to to keep yourself going is huge, even if it's a friend. You know, maybe it's not something you're thinking about. Maybe it's that person that you're like, you know what? I'm about to make a bad decision. And I come over <laughs> or talk to me so I don't make a phone call or, you know, something. Things like that where you could just have something that you could do to keep yourself from going backwards. It's really, really helpful. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's useful to remind people to have those options or to certainly use it and, and see where they can go. Tell me, I mean, if you were to try and describe your fire in your belly in, in one or two words, Stacey, what would they be? Um, ripple effect. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, whatever I do affects other people. And my power to experience my own life could be so cool. You know, like every moment I show up that isn't, how I would want to show up, I'm missing out on what life is like when I am that person and what difference I could be making um, to my kids, 
to my soul. Like I think about, I'm take, I'm here to take care of my soul. Like what if I give up on my own soul? That's kind of horrible. You know, even if it's not about other people, it's about well, we were put here to experience something and we're just throwing that away. That's awful. So even if it's not about another person, it's about our own gift we've been given and just throwing that away, like the ripple effect that we get to experience in our own life, the happiness, the, the feelings, the anything, you know, going to do anything, brushing your teeth. No, in a different mindset could be a different life experience. Like maybe you have a thought you didn't have otherwise that ends up, you know, creating this next thing you get to go do that you never would have thought of because you weren't in state because you were out of authenticity. So yeah, ripple effect for me is really powerful because it means that for my own life, for me personally, and for other people that witness it is um, more powerful than we might think. You know, even staying the same staying in a circumstance, it's not, as, we're not as sneaky as we think about not letting other people see our pain. People are really perceptive. It's like kids know stuff. I mean, my daughter, when my um, husband would yell at me in the front seat, she, she, would, she would think, I love you, mommy. You know, she heard it, like she knew. She was four, you know? So people that are adults and looking in on our lives, we think we're making this big, you know, um, a hidden life of, of nobody knows. Well, if they don't know the circumstance, you certainly, you're not you, you know, like people aren't experiencing you who you really are. And so that's, that's an example to other people to stay the same, you know, people stay. I had my boss, the one that told me I was doing too much. I used to follow to all these companies because he was so cool to work with. He was a neat person. Um, well, actually, maybe I shouldn't give that rec uh, attribution. <laughs> anyway, there are some people that can say that I respect. I won't give all the details, but I respect what you just did because I don't have the courage to do that. You know, whatever it is, like in that scenario, it could have been as, you know, me, me moving to California. I don't know. Any, anything. But, um, you know, other people, you would be surprised at what an impact you can have on other people just by not changing they might just stay the same too because they don't see you changing and they don't see examples of that or they don't even realize that they're in a bad scenario mm -hmm. so we all have a ripple effect whether we change or don't change and um personally and for other people and i just when it's like self-care right we all know we're supposed to do it but sometimes we only do it if it's going to help someone else <laughs> so if you're not in a place where you could do it for yourself yet um, and you need power coming from somewhere else, you know, if you for your kids or something, you know, sometimes people don't leave marriages unless they feel like their kids are in danger or whatever. Um, you know, for me, my daughter started showing up like I was. She was seven and um, she was apologizing to people when they were mean to her. And it ripped my heart out. Like I get emotional thinking about that. Like that was huge for me to leave. I thought staying was the best thing for them because they don't know, you know, I'll just keep everything happy and they'll get to have a family and live this life. And, but she started apologizing the way I was apologizing to get, to keep the peace. And I'm like, nope, that ripple effect is not happening. My mom did that. My mom's mom did that. Like though, that was the example you know, they had, they didn't know anything different. So if I don't do something different, my girls are going to have this life experience because they don't know different. They think that's, it's the person that loves them and is taking care of them is doing that. Then that's what they're supposed to do. Right? So if you can't do it for you yet. You know, think about the ripple effect that you have by not changing yet or the things you can't give to other people until you're in a healthy place and you can start to really do it for yourself. Um, use, use whatever you can get because odds are if you're, first of all, if you're listening to this, there's something that's missing, right? We don't listen to inspiring shows if we're hundred percent fulfilled could be, but there's always something more, right? There's always something more that we could get inspired to do or hear other people's stories. And, um, so if you're listening, there's probably something that isn't right. Something's off. 
even if you don't know what it is. So it's just a matter of knowing that that's impacting you for sure and definitely other people and use whatever you can to get to where you have the awareness to be able to take the next step and not judgy. You know, I think one of the first things people do is, God, I'm such an idiot or I'm, I'm going to ruin people's lives and why can't I just do this? Well, it's because you're in a situation of miserable a miserable place like how can you expect yourself to know how to to do all this stuff when you you're in the circumstance that you're in so it's not that simple what's what can be done where i'm suggesting any kind of simplicity is being able to go and tap into your own feelings and as far as you can and if you're not and if it's painful to go there then how do you want to feel instead if you don't want to feel that pain instead of just numbing out like what would I like to feel right now, whether it feels possible or not? What would I like to feel right now? And what could I do right now that would get me a little closer? It doesn't have to, you don't have to be convinced that it's going to work. But just what's something that you have the capacity to do? Like people who are really depressed sometimes, you know, there was somebody who went through one of my programs and um, had this plan for, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. And then she started to go back into depression again. And... Uh, you know, taking out the trash wasn't even possible for her anymore. And, and I was like, okay, well, what, what could you do? Oh, well, I could do this. I'm like, but could you though? Like, or do you really have the capacity to do that right now? Are you going to convince yourself if you can't even get yourself to take out the trash? Like, what could you do? Could you read your core values today on a piece of paper? Yeah, I could do that. You know, so doesn't that, that's an action. Reading what matters. Okay. Even if it doesn't do anything for you today, you know, read it tomorrow, read it tomorrow, something, something, even if it's a minute, one minute of something, put a sticky note somewhere, um, put some, a pop up in your phone or something, anything that, and be happy that you did that for yourself or find some pride or let it give you courage or let you let yourself be proud of yourself for doing something because there's so many people that don't and it's not because they can't or they, they could very well just not be in a, a mental space to do it yet but um you know maybe they don't know what they could do next or maybe they haven't learned something yet but then just keep looking you know just don't give up on yourself because why do you want another 40 years of this? <laughs> and you don't want to just give up on life. Um, I've had so many people come into my programs that said that they wanted before, not from my program, but before, um, like years and decades before, that they had um, tried to kill themselves and it didn't work. Almost, I think 90% of the people that have been in my programs I mean, it's a smaller percentage, but I mean, that many people to be able to say that have had that experience and now all they want to do is enjoy life. That's why they're joining is because they know that life can be so much better and that they want to just keep living that life and want to keep going and want to do more and, and experience more. And they had tried to kill themselves. There's another podcast that I was on um, where the guy said he tried to kill himself three times and it didn't work until someone was like, well, somebody needs you to be here. <laughs> somebody, somebody wants you to stick around. Um, so I've never met anyone who's tried to kill themselves and, and been sad that it didn't work, you know, a few years later, they were just like, thank God that didn't work. So, um, you know, just would recommend and focusing on how you want to feel instead and just doing something baby until you can get closer. Give yourself the resource, right? Your backup plan. Like if you just can't get yourself out of that thinking that you're even listening, you know that there's another thing you could do. Something. Something, you know. Even if it's teensy tiny. Tuning in tomorrow. <laughs> so it's yeah. not about, isn't it? Do you say baby steps? Baby steps. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. baby could be minuscule. Like it could be you know, just deciding to wake up again tomorrow, you know, could be until you can get, and then what's the next thing you're going to do? Just try to take it up to the next one. After you do one, then come up with another one 
and another one until you're walking. Something. Yeah. Tell us, Tyson, where can people learn more about you? Where can they find out about you? Can track you down, hunt you down, follow you, stalk you, any of the above? Yeah. Yeah. So um Facebook, I'm uh, at your journey fuel on Facebook, at your journey fuel. And um there I will promote my programs, you know, different things that you can do to get to me. The the easiest way, um, walk the talk weekend, which is walkthetalkweekend.com. That's the program that I've talked about a couple of times, the two and a half day program for anybody who puts your um, podcast name in the source. So it's an $897 program, but when you sign up, it'll say, how did you hear about us? Um, just type in um, your podcast, Fire in the Belly, and I'll gift you that program for free and a ticket for a friend. So you can come and you can gift a ticket to a friend for the next Walk to Talk weekend. and. I just finished one. The next one I'm working on the dates for. So go ahead and you can sign up there now and then I'll get the dates out in the next couple of weeks for the next one. And then also once you're there, I can always um, reach out to you or you can you can note that you want to hear more and I can make sure you're on the list for programs that I'll, I'm going to be creating more programs. I'm actually in the process of doing that right now. Some additional programs that are a little shorter and um, are accessible at any time. So those are coming out. So at your journey fuel, follow me there. Um, and then signing up for Walk the Talk weekend for sure. And I mean, it's $897 at no cost to you. So why not, right? Take the little baby step. Um, and um, those are the best things that you could do for that, for sure. Love it. And is there a um, final message you'd like to leave with our listeners for the world or for them to take away yeah i just you know give yourself some grace um give yourself a pat on the back for even being here and listening and um letting positivity into your life and knowing that there's more um and just using something as small as how do you feel right now and how do you want to feel instead and letting that give you direction because a lot of times we'll expect us to have these answers and then we don't, we get paralyzed or spinning and, and we spend two years and then I'm talking from my own experience before I started applying some of these things that I teach now is, you know, but I don't know what I want to do instead. I don't know what else I want to do. Um, you know, I don't know what my purpose is. I just don't want to hate my job. I don't know what I want to do instead. So, you know, well, how do you want to feel? What's one thing you could do to get closer? And then pretty soon you'll find your way. So it's when you don't just have the answers, just ask a different question. And usually, um, how do I want to feel instead? And what's one thing I can do to get closer to that? We'll get you there. Just follow the scent. There's always something more. And just to give yourself the opportunity to live life as who you're here to be. And it's really that simple. It doesn't may not sound that simple, but if you just find your fire within your fire in your belly and give yourself a chance to find it that um, you will have a completely different life experience and all it takes is one baby step at a time to live a life you love waking up to love it love it stacy listen thank you so much for your time today i appreciate it I appreciate all you've shared and um there's so much coming up and obviously that uh, the great offer of that program there for people to to attend and to join you know your workshop so that's that's wonderful so Thank you again. I appreciate you. Well, I'm just so grateful that you have your program for people and give you some kudos for what you do. And, you know, you show up at the microphone, you go out and get guests and and want to spread the the hope in life and stories for people. And, you know, you're showing up as who you're here to be. And I just want to give you a shout out for that. It's pretty amazing. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate the feedback. So thank you. Until the next time. Thank you, Tracy. Oh, Stacy, sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thank you. Bye for now.